for 6453. Damn, that's hard. Equinix in Japan. Who will send it to 7545? Wow. I think that's Australian. Um, who will send it to 56203? I have no idea. Um, and it will get to its intended destination. So that's kind of a peek of what's inside a routing table. Why do we do this? What's the aim of these protocols? Nobody runs networks manually. You configure your router and just let it go because the routing protocol is designed to be robust. When stuff happens, you don't have to leap onto the router and correct things. You don't have to shore up the fabric and reprogram your router. If you've got things done right, the routing protocol detects breakage and heals straight away. You have to do nothing. And as long as you have a rich connection fabric, so let's say I'm a network and I have a connection to Sebastian and a connection to Nick, and there are further connections out. If I'm using this connection and it breaks, it might happen in the middle of the night, I might have no clue that it's happened, but immediately I will re-advertise my routes through my alternate. The rest of you will pick it up and shift your traffic through the alternate path. And when it gets restored, for whatever reason, automatically will restore the previous topology. So the thing about routing is it's self-healing. So if there are alternative paths around damage, the network will use it. It's also really, really fast. Inside a network, we can now tune routing protocols to converge in milliseconds, in thousandths of a second. So this isn't a wait forever. Um, this is really quick. Across the world, even here in Baku, an event in Australia, the other side of the planet, the networks here will A, listen, and B, converge to new paths, an average within 70 seconds all over the world. So even at the gross scale, without any human intervention, this is really efficient. The, the routing system is incredibly fast. So what do we use routing for? Um, we use it for connectivity, and that's great, but we use it also in our business. Because, of course, if you are an ISP, not every network is the same. There are some folk who pay me money. They're customers, and I love them dearly. And uh, I like giving them traffic because the more traffic I give them, unless you're Telecom Italia, the more money they pay me. With Telecom Italia, that doesn't happen. I don't know why it's Italian. Um, <laughs> other kinds of relationships are peers. And this is something that's almost unique to the internet. The telephony folk never quite figured this out. It was too complicated for them. But it's really simple when you're a peer. I send you traffic, you send me traffic, and we don't pay each other anything. A huge amount of the world is actually connected through peering because it's convenient and it's a simple balanced approach. So yes, there are some things called peers where we don't pay each other. And then there are upstreams. Upstreams are folk where I pay you money, you pay me nothing. And if you go back into that path that I showed you before, that hop from the green exchange through to cable and wireless looks horribly like an upstream. Cable and wireless don't have connectivity to Azerbaijan for free. They're selling their service. So there, I'm pretty sure, in that first link up there between four and five is an upstream. So all of these relationships you actually see inside the routing system. These days, you don't just have one link. You might have two or three or four. And if you've bought all these links, you don't want to have run one running hot and the other four running idle just in case. That's a waste of money. So what you'd also like to do is evenly load the system. I noticed driving out here on the bus this morning, do you notice it too? There are two roads that are completely stuffed, 10 lanes of traffic, nobody moving, and all the other sort of roads look really okay. In routing, you can do better than that. You can actually do traffic engineering that will even your traffic flows across multiple links. And the more care and attention you pay to this, typically the better the result that you can buy multiple links that will fail over to each other. But in the normal course of event, you can actually even your traffic across all of them as well. So all of those requirements can be expressed in routing. The other thing about routing, which is really cool, is that my router sees all of you at once. 
I see the entire internet on my box. Your box sees the entire internet too. And that can give you some amazing views. So if you look at the number of entries in the routing system since 1989, and the way it's grown over time, I can actually relate a whole bunch of events to the progress of that red line. Does anyone remember the great internet boom of 2000? Oh, come on, you all do, right? This is wonderful. We're all having so much fun. And do you remember the great bust of 2001 where everyone decided, oh, there's no money in the internet. Look what happened to the routing system for a year. We got to 100,000 entries, and then for the next year, there was no growth. The money just left the internet and went off to do other things for a year. And then we started thinking, this is pretty cool again. And by 2005, the internet was growing like crazy. Why? Because a lot of the world was rolling out DSL. Fascinatingly, that global financial crisis of 2008 wasn't a big blip. It almost was a hiccup in the growth of the internet. And you'd see that that red line just continued on just fine. And the other thing that I find really, really, really strange is up on the top right, you'd think when we ran out of V4 addresses, the growth in routing would stop. Nope. Somehow, we seem to be doing just as good a job today in adding new uh, entries to the routing system as we did previously. Um, how inventive we are. The other thing I kind of liked was uh, last week, there are a few places on the planet which from an internet perspective are really, really concentrated points of connectivity. And of course, one of them's New York. And in fact, it's down there about where the eye of that storm was, which flooded a large number of data centers. So I looked at the routing table and about the same time as they were getting flooding in the subways and flooding in some of the data centers, the number of routes on the internet dropped dramatically. Not that dramatically. We lost around 2,000 routes and around 200 ASs over the next 14 hours. What's also interesting is the recovery. You can actually see that about 30% of the networks came back online within a couple of hours. And after that, it was sort of, oh, the rest are hard. You can actually see the recovery efforts, which I reckon is quite amazing that I'm sitting on a router somewhere deep in Australia, actually watching in real time the effects of a storm hitting New York and seeing it in the routing system. Um, what is hot in routing today? Routing is a rumour mill. There are no facts, only rumours. The problem is, is that we don't pay our operators the highest sums of money. In fact, in most of network ISPs, network operators get paid almost the lowest. And finger trouble is everywhere. And if you're manually configuring things, it's often the case you just get it wrong, as what happened yesterday in Indonesia, where according to a hardware error, oh, isn't it nice to blame the vendor? Um, a network in Indonesia started re-advertising routes that were actually routes into Google. And all of a sudden, around 5% of the world didn't see any of Google services for about half an hour. Why? Because the network's routing system is not secure. We don't understand the difference between truth and a lie. And while it's easy and amusing to point at finger trouble problems and go, well, it wasn't that fun, the world is more hostile than that. And that what you can do with fat fingers, you can do with malice. And one thing we're certainly well aware of in the routing system is that we're nowhere near as secure as we need to be. And that currently is one of the hottest topics around in routing. And the other hot topic is that we have no idea where this is going. Even seven years ago, back in two, eight years ago, back in 2004, the internet had 100,000 routes. And you go, well, that's kind of okay. A lot of the high-speed memory systems used in routers had the equivalent of 164,000 or 200,000 entries, so 100,000 seemed pretty nice. But the growth of the internet is inexorable, and that any piece of hardware you were using in 2004 now won't work in 2012. That that inexorable pace of growth, you're now going to have a system that co needs to cope with a minimum 
of half a million entries in your high-speed memory, and over the ensuing years will probably get a lot higher. Making a routing system that was originally designed for a handful of computers, big computers running over very slow links, to have the same technology operate over up to a billion individual systems running over links of terabits per second is a true testament to just how amazing this routing protocol standards are. Um, the current ones you'll meet, they're all actually open standards. They're not owned by anybody. This isn't proprietary vendor product. These are standards that have been developed inside places like the IETF and are truly open and available uh, technologies. A lot of the world runs on open shortest path first routing, an algorithm originally invented by Dijkstra, a Dutch computer scientist about 30 years ago. And uh, a few folk run uh, IS to IS, a protocol originally invented, uh, God, it originally came out of DEC, if anyone remembers, Digital Equipment Corporation, who were bought by Compaq, who were bought by HP, who currently died or something. Uh, but anyway, IS 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 now an open protocol. And on the exterior world, um, the world uses BGP, a protocol developed and maintained by the IETF, which kind of glues it all together. And BGP is one of the more amazing protocols we use. So that is a very quick overview of routing. And um, you want to do questions at the end or? Yeah, OK. So I'll hand it back. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. Our next presenter will be uh, Curtis Lindquist. Sweden, he's uh, with NetNob, um, will uh, take a peering and IXPs. So, uh, what else do I want to do? Uh, can I just use the microphone? Can I just use the microphone? Can I just use Bluetooth? Yeah, but if I put that in here, I just. Just use the microphone, right? Check in the room. Okay, we'll do that then. Uh, sorry about that. Um, that. That what happens uh, when you try to do things too advanced. So uh, my name is uh, is Curtis Lindquist. I'm the CEO of Netnode uh, in Sweden. We uh, run the internet exchanges in Sweden, as uh, a little bit Jeff talked about before. And um, before I did this, and we also run one of the, the root servers that Paul talked about before. Um, and I also have a background in that, that I used to do handle peering and traffic exchange for one of the largest carriers in the world. Um, so I want to explain a little bit how this traffic exchange works and what this means. It is, as Jeff said, a very hot topic when it comes to governance and internet governance discussions. Um, so what we're talking about is that if I have my laptop app up here on the left-hand corner and I'm connected to a carrier here in Azerbaijan, how do I get to that Google page as Jeff talked about, by using the routing and the DNS that Paul talked about, how do my packets actually get from here in Azerbaijan over to Google so I can access that page? And we talk about the traffic exchange and peering or transit as you call it, we actually talk about this commercial agreement between these two operators. And now we get to the film I wanted to show to see if this works and explain this. Check the weather, watch a movie, 
to study the Peloponnesian War. It feels like there's one wire connecting you directly to the thing you want. But a billion other people are connecting to a billion other things at the same time. How does that happen? It's really about making agreements. Think of networking as a game. It only works if we agree to play by the same rules. Otherwise, it's not much fun. If you can get two or more computers to play together, you have a network. If your friend can do it too, there's another network. But if you both agree that your networks will play the same way, now you can hook the two together. You have an internetwork. The rules we play by are called the Internet Protocol. And as long as we all agree, we can keep adding more devices and more networks until the whole world is connected. That's what the Internet is. A network of networks that share with each other. Every device on the Internet has its own unique address. Anything you send the Internet is really just a message from one device to another. But it doesn't travel in one big block. It's pulverized into tiny packets of data, each one wrapped with info about what it is, where it came from, and where it's going. This way, your one message can actually take several different paths to its destination. Then, by following the protocol, the receiving device knows how to put it all back together. The strength of the internet is that it's decentralized. With so many possible connections, there is no single point of failure. If one path gets overloaded or broken, the data just takes a different path. Even if a big chunk of the internet gets wiped out, your message can still find its way. But let's say you use one internet provider and your friend is on a different one. How does your data really get from one network to the other? Some companies make private connections with each other to exchange traffic. But more and more traffic is flowing through shared service platforms we call Internet Exchange Points. An Internet Exchange is a place where many different organizations come together to interconnect their technology. There may be access providers, broadcasters, publishers, social network sites, telecom operators, really anybody who relies on network traffic can benefit from the exchange. By connecting in a common place, they save costs, and the traffic between them flows faster and much more efficiently. Traditionally, providers have sold each other passage on their networks. But for some providers who regularly exchange traffic, all that buying and selling can get to be more trouble than it's worth. Many of them saw that if they just halfway, then everybody's costs go down, and the traffic moves more smoothly. Providers are able to make a single connection to the platform to exchange traffic with many participants. This way of doing things is called peering, and it's making the internet faster and more affordable for everybody. The exchange participants make deals with each other according to mutual benefit, so the peering system tends to regulate itself. It may seem like companies are giving away their services, but in fact, each is providing their part of the whole solution their customers need to most efficiently and reliably exchange traffic. The Internet is open, decentralized, and totally neutral. Its intelligence lives at the edge, not in the core. No single organization controls it, and that's why works as well as it does. By agreeing to cooperate, we all make the internet happen. And that's how the internet happens. So, uh, I hope that gave you a little bit of illustration about what this traffic exchange is and how this works and also illustrate the routing that Jeff talked about. Um, this movie is available online, by the way. It's actually made by the Association of 
exchange points uh, called EuroIX. Um, so wh what's the basis of having this and what's driving some of these commercial agreements? Um, well, one single provider in the world will never have all the providers, um, all the, have all the customers. And also every provider has a very limited footprint and might also have different, totally different customer bases. For example, cable TV providers might, uh, or cable companies might have more eyeballs and other carriers might have more business customers, etc. It might be different target groups, different target audiences, and they will have a, a or content, and they must have this way of changing traffic as you saw in the movie. And what we do in doing this is basically two types of agreements. We have the peering, where we exchange traffic, me and Jeff decide to exchange traffic without any form of settlement, because it will be a mutual benefit to us and our customers to do this traffic exchange. The opposite is that I have a global worldwide network and Jeff here has a very small network in Canberra and he wants to reach the rest of the world and I said, that's fine, Jeff, but you have to pay me. And that's called transit and Jeff will pay me and I will carry his traffic to the rest of the world. Uh, so in that case, I, I will also carry traffic from the world to him and he will send me money, but I won't give him any money. So in, in both cases, traffic flows both way. In one way, ex in the later, later case, in transit, money flows in one way towards me. Why do we pay for traffic at all, and why don't, don't we all exchange traffic for free? And these are not necessarily arguments that I would agree with. When I was the world's largest transit sa salesman, I, I did agree with them. But uh, there are a few reasons that, that often is argued why. One is that if I have a global spanning network, uh, or a very large network than, than the person I'm exchanging traffic for, I will have a higher cost to transport the traffic from Canberra, from Jeff's house, to here. And if I own that network, I think I deserve some uh, cost compensation for it, while Jeff, who only has to run his local network in Canberra, doesn't have the same cost. Um, th that's, that's one of the reasons. The other, um, uh, normally this goes from a smaller operator to a larger operator. Uh, there can also be an, a reason for this might also be, uh, for example, market positioning. If me and Jeff are competing for the same users and I, for some reason, has a service he wants, I might use this, uh, try to create a service differentiation between me and Jeff by denying his customers a direct route to me by sending it a different way. Uh, that's another reason, but there are a few strategies behind this. But this, co this, this cost and coverage argument is sort of the basis where this came from. Uh, why not pay for traffic? Why don't we just always pay for this? Well. As the movie said, if me and Jeff both have networks in Canberra, Jeff is targeting only eyeballs or, or uh, end-user customers, and I'm uh, only targeting corporates, we don't actually necessarily have a competing customer base. We have roughly the same footprint of the network, and we have roughly the same cost, and it's, it's of mutual benefit for both of us to exchange traffic. And we both gain from it. We don't have to do any complex billing schemes. We don't have to do any co complex uh, agreements, we can just establish the connection and we share traffic. What happens, and historically what happened was when the internet first evolved and it went from the US into Europe, for example, we found that the people who were doing this carrying of traffic from the US into Europe uh, tended to be foreign companies, very large telcos, and we sent the traffic in many cases from one European country via the US and back to Europe. This was very expensive and highly inefficient, so people decided there must be better ways of doing this. This happened to coincide with the deregulation of the markets in Europe, and we had a lot of new operators being uh, launched in Europe, and these operators had one common enemy, the old incumbents. And if we could come up with a way where we could make them not get money from us, and we instead could get better performance than they had, we would do so. And we established all these exchange points around Europe. Today, there's 124, 25 in the 28 countries. It's the most dense region in the world of exchange points where all of these operators exchange traffic. And by not giving money to the incumbents, we had the money to in invest in our own infrastructure. This is how this all started. And we could provide a better service to our customers at a larger footprint. And this eventually grew into what we have today, where we have different tiers of operators that offer, uh, uh, operates in different regions, in different settings, with different products, and that generates different uh, business models. Um, but this, this is a lot of things that happen to, to, to these developments. So the three types of interconnects we can do is transit, as I said. Someone pays me to carry traffic around the world. 
we can have private pairings, as you saw in a movie, where we have a dedicated connection between me, me and Jeff, for example, or me and Sebastian, we have this. But if we're all in the same city, or if we're even in the same building, where we have our technical equipment, it becomes quickly quite messy and very expensive to maintain all these connections. So instead, we create a shared infrastructure called these exchange points, and we can have one connection, and I can reach both Sebastian and Jeff over the same connection. And that's called public peering. Another difference, and Jeff was a little bit touching upon this, between peering and transit is that when I do this exchange of peering without the settlement between me and Jeff, I will only do that for me and my customers. So if I am a medium-sized operator, I will have Sebastian as a customer, as a smaller operator, and have Jeff as a, as a peer with me. I will only exchange the, the routing information for how Jeff can you reach me and my customers, not the rest of the world. I don't care about that. It's just for me and my customers. However, if Jeff comes and buys, uh, uh, well, take the same example, he says, in this case, operator A and B, sorry, in the first case, if operator A and B here uh, is having a um, uh, peering and so does A and C, there's no customers in this picture, there's three parties to the agreement, operator A will give its own uh, um, destinations and its customers to operator C and to operator B. But operator A will not share any reachability between B and C, because they are not customers. In the second example, however, C is a customer of A. This is the case where Jeff is my customer. I will then uh, send this information on to operator B. And that's the dif uh, distinction between these agreements as well. In reality, though, this is a lot more complex. The, the models are much more complex. And in the end, it comes down to commercial negotiation between the, the parties of what, under what conditions traffic will be exchanged. I've I given you a little bit idea of this. It it's tends to be a lot more complex, especially if you're a larger carrier or two large carriers. They can be very, very fierce, hard commercial negotiations. But what is important is that they, these negotiations are going on. It's up to the carriers who are the best negotiator or what they want to achieve, just like any other commercial discussion. Uh, and um, that's the basis of this. Uh, I was going to say one thing. The other thing is, of course, that we are seeing developing markets like Africa, parts of Asia, South America, etc., where there is not as many exchange points and where the establishment of more exchange points and more peering is actually driving costs down. And that is making the internet cheaper and affordable and more accessible for all of the, the end users there. And ISOC has a great paper out not very long ago about uh, what happened in Kenya when peering took up that I all recommend you to read if you're interested. The other point that's important to make here is that uh, the establishment of these exchange points uh, is also benefiting the local community in that you get more stable, more robust internet uh, because you're not depending on, on, second, on resources outside your country and you also get faster connectivity, which is a, a great value to this. There are some strange hybrid models called paid peering. This is normally done by I'll be a bit blunt here, by incumbents who are realizing that if you deregulate the market, you can only lose a revenue, and they're trying to protect, protect the lost revenue by forcing all the other operators to pay to access to the few remaining customers they have as the customers are walking out the doors to the new established customers, uh, uh, competitors. But that's a very, very rare model, by the way. And that was all I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you, Corpus. Thank you very much. Our Last presenter will be Ramon with Aphidius. Ram, please. Thank you, Sebastian. So um, let's let's start with trying to figure out something. All of you have uh, a computing device of some sort. You have a laptop. You have a smartphone. One of these ki types of devices. And every once in a while, you type in Facebook.com or Google or something like that, and you expect that when the network is up and you're connected to the, to the internet, you expect that you will be taken. When you type in a, a, a particular web address, you will be taken from that address to the destination. And this happens near instantaneously. How does it happen underneath? So I'm here to share a little bit of the story of what happens when you type in your, your web address into your address bar uh, or when you click on your app in a smartphone, what happens underneath. Uh, 
because it's it seems like it it's instantaneous and um, someone said that uh, technology sufficiently advanced is not distinguishable from magic and uh, there are folks who think that there is magic underneath but it's actually fairly straightforward so when you type in facebook.com or you type in google.com that's a a domain name and effectively domain names are a gateway if you will to the internet so all those IP addresses that Jeff talked to you about and uh, the the address uh, the internet exchanges that uh, Curtis just talked about so a domain name eventually uh, is nothing more than a a shell if you will something that lets us human beings remember where to go to because in s underneath computers end up translating or mapping those domain names into actual addresses, whether it is a, uh, an, an IP address of the type that Jeff is talking about, or when Paul earlier was talking to you about Quad A records, those are IPv6 type of addresses. But regardless, computers uh, find a way, need to have a way to translate the address, the, the domain name, the actual address that you remember, to translate that into numbers. And that's a big part of what the domain name system itself does. The domain name system is itself uh, quite a hierarchical uh, system. So it starts with the dot, uh, and that dot, if you will, is kind of where the root of the domain name system is. And then it goes down to the top level. So in the top level, you have uh, top level domains such as com or org or info or UK or AZ. Then it goes a level lower, what's called second level domains. There you have google.com, facebook.com, redcross.org. So that's at the second level. And then further, it goes down to the third level. So www.google.com uh, know, or donate.redcross.org, that's at the third level. And further below. And there really is only uh, a, a, a particular uh, length limit to the size of a fully qualified domain name. But other than that, you could literally decide to have a.b.c.d.e.redcross.org if you so chose to. And there's really nothing that stops you from getting there. Now, what exactly happens when you type in uh, facebook.com on your, on your browser's address bar? your computer is connected or your your phone is connected to an internet provider and that internet provider operates what's called a DNS uh, resolver a domain name system resolver and all that does is uh, your your computer sends a request to that resolver and says hey do you know where facebook.com is do you know what it maps to and if that computer if that device knows it and it thinks it's, it's been recently updated, it sends a, a response back to you saying, yeah, I know it. If it doesn't know it, then it says to everybody who is connected to it, hey, does anybody around here know where Facebook.com is? Right? And anybody who knows, in fact, everybody who knows, sends back the response all at once. And the way the, the, the basic system works, whoever the, the sending computer, the sending resolver, whoever got the answer back to them first, it says, oh, okay, that must be good, sends it back on, right? So if, the, if your nearest resolver knows the answer, it returns to you. But if it doesn't know it, it goes one level further. If that system doesn't know it, it goes yet another level further. But it, but it keeps climbing up this hierarchy until eventually it says, well, actually, I don't know where Facebook.com is. Uh, where should I go? And then that resolver says, well, you know what? We know where .com is. So let's go ask the people who run .com where Facebook.com is. Because .com itself you know, keeps a list of every single domain name that has been registered inside of .com. Now, it's possible that those resolvers don't even know where .com is at, right? Then what it does is it says, you know what? I know where the dot is. You know, I know where the root servers are. Let me go to the dots and ask them, hey, tell me where is com. Where can I go find com? 
So the root service says, here is where you can find com. It then goes over to the root, to the com operator, says, tell me where facebook.com is. You get the answer. Then it says, oh, but actually the, the user wanted to go to www.facebook.com. So it goes to Facebook and says, now tell me, where is www? And facebook.com says, oh, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to get to the page. Here are the things to do. And it just happens. And all of this happens probably in, um, wh while Jeff was talking about 437 milliseconds, the, this other part of it probably takes you know, another, depending on where you're at, but it probably takes another anywhere from five to uh, 100 milliseconds extra. But it's still a pretty straightforward process. Now, there are a few enhancements inside of here. Um, I, I talked about the way that your local computer looks it up. Now, as an efficiency, one of the things that the local computer does is it says, if you asked me for facebook.com, the next time you come and you ask me for facebook.com, if I got a valid answer, I don't go look it up all the way up. I just say, I already got the answer. Let me send it on. Unless the folks at .com or the folks who run Facebook say, don't keep the answer stored in your system for a long time. Keep updating it. Keep renewing it regularly. Right. So this is a piece called caching. And most resolvers end up holding on to the translation between the domain name and the address, the IP address underneath it. They hold it for some amount of time. Now, there are, you'll find some other words, some other terminologies being used. You will hear something called zone files. You'll hear s uh, stuff called glue. You'll hear stuff called resource records. Um, and I think the, the, the short way to really get through the, the technical pieces of it is uh, if you want the domain name system to work, then those, the, all of the parties that are, that are part of it, so .com, for example, they, ho they have what's called a zone file. All it is is a single, it's a, it's a large file that has a list of every name that is actually supposed to resolve on the internet, and then a bunch of other pointers to other places. So if you want to have an email sent, to somebody, you know, to, 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 to your email address at gmail.com, well, there is a particular record for it. There's a particular pointer. It's called a resource record for that, right? If uh, the domain name itself is signed, there is another pointer to it. So that's, in, in, a, in a nutshell, the, the way that the core of the domain name system itself works. Let me spend just a few minutes uh, speaking about uh, a few other uh, players in this domain name system. So we talked about, for instance, uh, in the case of uh, .com, we talked about how the .com registry has kind of one database, if you will. And in their system, in their database, they store a list of every .com domain that has been registered. Right? So uh, my company runs .info. We are the backend provider for .org. So we similarly have a list of every single .org domain name that has been registered or every single .info domain name that has been registered. Now, naturally, there can only be one of these kinds of databases, only one authoritative provider for that, because you really don't want to have ambiguity. You want redcross.org, you want to have only one redcross.org. And so there is one provider that has that information. And that provider ends up distributing that information all over the world to DNS resolvers everywhere in the world. But if you, the actual end user, wants to go and buy a domain name that's for yourself, for your own use, what you do in many cases is you go to an intermediary called a registrar. And the registrar is often separate from the registry. So the registry holds this authoritative system, this authoritative uh, list of uh, domain names in that particular top-level domain. The registrars are the place where a user, a, a registrant, can go to and say, I want to buy uh, redcrosssocks.org if it is available, right? Uh, or do donateblood.org if that is available. And the registrar interfaces with the registry to say, first of all, look up and tell me 
is such a domain name available? If it is available, then it makes them it, it makes them accessible uh, to the end user. So that's registries, registrars, and registrants. The simple way to keep that in mind is for every top level domain, there is one registry. There are usually many registrars, and there are often many, many registrants, right? So it's kind of a pyramid with a lot of registrants who go to a few registrars who all must go to a single registry. And that is the authoritative, that's the structure, if you will, the hierarchical structure. So how do these systems uh, interact and communicate with each other? And this is where the internet standards and the protocol uh, creation process comes in. So let me quickly uh, walk you through an example of what has happened in the domain name registry uh, area. So uh, not a long time ago, in uh, 1999, 2000 timeframe, there was no common standard, if you will, inside of uh, the, the internet for registrars and registries to interact with each other. There were standards that were uh, kind of industry standards created by various participants and players in the industry. But there was no commonly accepted uh, internet standard that allowed for interaction between registries and registrars. Um, and this led to the creation of what is called the Extensible Provisioning Protocol, or EPP. Uh, for short, the EPP standard, or the EPP protocol uh, creation process began. Now, typically uh, in, the, in the IETF, the creation of a protocol is not the uh, easiest or necessarily the fastest uh, thing to happen. And this is by design. Um, things need to happen as, as fast as they should, but at the same time, not at some significant amount of haste. So the very first draft, an internet draft um, for EPP was submitted in November of 2000. Um, the first registries that implemented EPP came live in June, July of 2001. In fact, we ran .info and we implemented uh, an EPP-based uh, registry, the f one of the first ones uh, in the industry, but we did that in July of 2001 before there was any real standard for, uh, for, a, for a common protocol. And we were hoping that this EPP would actually become a real standard and would be adopted by everybody. But that was, that was it. It was just a hope, right? There was a working group, the IETF. Uh, in the IETF, uh, the, the idea went from a birds of feather or a boff. It went from that to a formal working group being chartered and the working group worked on multiple versions and multiple drafts of this EPP protocol. And eventually, in 2004, March, was when a, a set of RFCs were, were published. The first set of you know, internet standards were published. By this time, there were easily a dozen registries around the world that had already implemented various versions of EPP. Right? But what that led to was both diversity of actual implementation, right? And it gave strength to what, what the IETF protocol working group was working on. It said, clearly, the, the methodologies being used here are truly extensible, and they are relevant to industry. So the adoption of the standard, if you will, there is no regulator who comes in to the various registries and says, you must implement uh, a particular standard. In the case of GTLDs, uh, ICANN actually uh, does say that RFCs must be implemented. But if you look at TLDs around the world, look at CCTLDs, the country code uh, top level domains, uh, in, in many cases, there is not a single authority um, that specifies what standards must be implemented. But because there is both strong consensus inside of the IETF and real implementation of these protocols, EPP is now effectively the standard way by which registries and registrars interact with each other. So that's an example of protocol development and how in the IETF, uh, what begins as an idea eventually converts into a standard that 
Today, if you go and ask a registry operator who is of any import, you ask them, um, are they standards compliant? If they tell you yes, by default, they mean that they conform to the EPP RFCs. Although in many cases, there is not someone uh, enforcing it upon them or someone telling them you must do it. This is simply because everybody, all their peers are doing it. If you don't do it, you, you don't comply, right? So it's a, it's a system that is often based on merit. And I, I speak about merit because there is a counterpoint. Um, there was a, uh, earlier I was talking to you about DNS and how, how these addresses work, right? And I was saying, if you, if your computer wants to go to facebook.com and, it, and it, the way it finds that is it sends out that request to anybody nearby, any other resolver nearby, and says, hey, tell me where, where facebook.com is. If somebody who is listening to your request, if they are able to intercept your request stream, and if they're able to insert themselves and respond to your request for where is facebook.com, if, they if they're able to respond to that before anybody else is able to, they can send you to a completely spurious place. They can send you to the place that you never intended to go and you, the end user, actually does not have much control over it because you entrusted the network, you entrusted the DNS system, and you said, I'm gonna send this down uh, to my computer. The computer got a response that it thought was accurate, but that cache that I was talking about, you know, the list of addresses, that got poisoned along the way by, by some malicious actor. So the, the, the idea was to create a, uh, a bit more security around this, and the, uh, the intention was to create what was called DNSSEC, DNS Security Extensions. Now, I must tell you, DNS Security Extensions has been an absolute overnight success. It started in 1999. It is yet to be implemented across all of the TLDs in the world. Uh, and you, you have an example here of an idea that began with a significant amount of complexity, and as it has gone through iterations, uh, in some areas, the complexity has increased. In other areas, it has decreased. But we are still yet to see widespread implementation of DNSSEC um, at the second and, and lower levels of the DNS hierarchy. Right? Uh, at the top level, uh, the root has now been signed with DNSSEC, uh, but that happened, I believe, in 2010 or 2000, uh, 2010. Uh, but the protocol work began in 1999. So there's an example there where simply beginning an, uh, an IETF process and, and building and writing out <coughs> um, a protocol does not automatically result in adoption. It requires uh, cooperation and requires uh, also uh, participants in the industry to actually say we, we believe that this is uh, important and, and actually go and implement it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ram. Uh, Paul, you were asking for a comment. Um, yeah, I, it occurs to me suddenly that I'm older than Ram. Um, so there was a protocol before EPP. Um, the original registry versus <coughs> registrar split was a uh, result of the IFWP, International Forum for the White Paper, uh, which caused uh, the network solutions to have to be broken up and have to more or less make a decision about uh, making one company the registrar, uh, which was Network Solutions, and the other one was uh, Registry, which was VeriSign. Um, and they spoke RRP, the Registry to Registrar Protocol, uh, which was invented in order to facilitate the first split because uh, the dot-com uh, was considered a monopoly and we didn't want it to be that as they started charging for domain names, that they would be the only ones allowed to have relationships with customers. So that's what created the uh, registry and registrar split, and ComNet and Org were using this for years before EPP was first proposed. Um, I also note that I remember starting on DNS security extensions in 1995. So uh, we're now in year 17 of production of something that has yet to even reach 10% uh, penetration. So if you thought that IPv6 was slow, 
I want you to consider that IPv6 work began later and finished earlier than DNSSEC. Thank you very much, Paul. I will now open the floor for questions. Uh, yes, we have a question here. Uh, I have a mic. Would you please uh, identify yourself and show up for, for the more participants? Okay. I'm, I'm Shiva Subramanian from uh, Internet Society India Chennai. I'm not proposing anything, but asking uh, for a clarification. In uh, 2008, IGF, I had an argument, not an argument, I made uh, Sebastian very, very angry. That was because uh, for IPv6, uh, IPv6 adoption, at the IGF, I made a suggestion that uh, IPv6 addresses can be allotted to users in advance ahead of the networks being prepared to deploy IPv6. That was with the idea of, uh, uh, for example, it would work like uh, if we have a if we have a uh, domain name, if a, if, if a user has a domain name, along with the domain name, an IPv6 could be allotted to the user on which uh, uh, the domain name would resolve. And the user would go to the web hosting provider to set up that domain name against that IPv6 address or go to its network and say that, uh, uh, map this IP, IPv6 address to my uh, domain. And uh, when the network is not prepared, it would say that, okay, we'll do it next year. Now we'll give you an IPv4 address. And, uh, and uh, later, uh, the user would come back to the network and uh, put some pressure on the, uh, I mean, this would put some pressure on the network to deploy IPv6. So this was uh, the idea. And uh, Sebastian said that it would complicate routing tables. And what I want to understand is uh, how it complicates routing table. Nothing more. It's not... Uh, we're setting up a, a four-year-old discussion with Shiva, yes. Yeah. Please. Um, I mentioned already that there are around 410,000 entries in the routing table. So I mentioned already there are just a little under half a million entries in the routing table. But there are 2.3 billion users. There aren't 2.3 billion entries in the routing table. And I'll go further. If there were an attempt to try and load a routing table with 2.3 billion entries, your router would crash, as would mine, as would everyone else's. In routing, we use abstraction and hierarchies, but a lot of networks use that. The international telephone network uses international country codes as an abstraction, so that all the telephones in, I have no idea what the code for this country is, but Australia, use plus six one. So all the phone numbers in Australia start with six one. If you dial a number, then all you have to do is look up the first 200 entries in the country table to know where to flick the call. So in one sense, the routing table for the telephone system at the international level only has 200 entries, even though there are six billion people on the planet. Similarly, we do the same trick in the internet, but we don't use countries, we don't use geography, we actually use network service providers. So a network service provider will go to their registry and say, you know, I have a need to number four million users, five million users, and we give them prefix, a common front end, a bit like that country code. In IPv6, it's typically a slash 32, which would encompass up to 7 million endpoints. And say, look, all of your customers will have the same common prefix. But if you try and pre-provision a network in advance without knowing who your service provider is going to be, what's the prefix? And if you wanted your own independent prefix, I have to route that prefix and the next and the next and the next all over the planet. I don't have routers that can do that. Thank you, Thank you John. Kami?
works like this. Okay, my name is Khaled Khuba. I'm uh, from uh, Google Policy Manager, North Africa. Uh, I have a question to Curtis about the uh, exchange point. We have seen some hybrid uh, model in uh, some countries where the, uh, the single point in, uh, in the country is one cable uh, maintained by the incumbent, and there is uh, several local ISPs that serves the internet connectivity through this single point and run local uh, exchange points. Can we consider this as exchange point yet? Or and also, if what are your thoughts about the dan this dangerous situation? So, so there are um, there's actually quite a few options of this. I mean, there is there is um, what you said is that you have an, an incumbent who basically uses exchange point as a marketplace for selling access to the rest of the world. Uh, that is actually a very dangerous situation because all the smaller or, or competing carriers will then uh, be locked in by the incumbent, right? And they have to do this, and that, that controls the cost. Uh, and that kills one of the main advantages of an exchange point in the way that you can lower the cost structure for these competing carriers that will take, um, that can exchange traffic freely without paying the incumbent the access. I mean, one of the most, there, there are, w one of the very critical reasons why exchanges are successful is that they are neutral and independent. They are not owned by any of the members of the exchange point and they are not, you, anybody can access them. So I don't have to go to the local incumbents uh, network to reach this exchange point, etc. That's a very, very important factor for reaching, for having a successful exchange point um, and, and, and to save on this cost. There is a, a, another take on this that you didn't say is that um, in many cases, this is also the only way out of the country uh, through the incumbent. The incumbent basically have a monopoly on, on international capacity. And one thing, this doesn't necessarily have exchange points to do, but one of the reasons that Europe was so immensely successful in building up broadband capacity, and if you ask me, is one of the most successful regions in the world, uh, short of Korea and Japan, and why we have so, so much down pressure on, on, on pricing, is that at the same time as these exchange points were built, what happened was that Europe deregulated the markets totally. And the single most contributing factor to the success of the exchange points, and the, the reason there are so many of them, was that deregulation. And most of the times when you see this is because we have countries around Africa who, and other parts of the world who do not deregulate totally, but have some very weird hybrid regulation model. And <laughs> if you, I, I'm gonna say something very politically not correct now, but the single best thing a government can do to help broadband development and bring prices down is to deregulate the markets. That's, that's the single most important factor they can do. And that will bring both exchange points and prices down. Of course, that will also bring the revenues of the carriers down, of the old incumbent, but a government will have to pick, do you want to build the networks for the end users and help the citizens, or do you want to help your incumbent? I mean, that's, that's basically the two. You can't, you can't do both, pick one or the other. Thank you. Okay, you like this. Yeah. So, uh, just a small comment. So, you confirm that the uh, business model of the exchange point is mainly a cost sharing business model and not a uh, making profit business model? Correct. The exchange points uh, that are successful are, are all uh, in various shapes or forms uh, non for profit organizations uh, that are not owned or controlled by anyone. There are exceptions, but they are, they are rare and, and, and special cases. In, in most parts of the world, they are. Uh, associations or mutual organizations that are owned by the members, controlled by the members, and do not try to make a profit of this. They, they just do cost recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Yeah, I, I could add a point. I could add a point there to the issue around exchange points and exchange operations. The motivation behind participation is cost minimization. Like if you're in a business, you know, revenue is good, spending money is bad. Something that's stops me spending as much money is good. And an exchange point becomes a substitute for some amount of upstream capacity you otherwise would have had to buy. So typically an individual operator will look at where their traffic is coming from or heading depending on what's the major cost element and then look at the destination points of that traffic and then look at are there ways that I can obtain connectivity towards those endpoints 
without necessarily paying my upstream. And that then becomes, well, if I go to there and participate in the exchange, I can gain that traffic without paying additional transit costs. So firstly, you find that local exchange points in a market help locals. But then you find that some of the folk who are expanding start building their network out and reaching into other exchange points. So there's a lot of exchange points in London, in Vienna, in Frankfurt, in Stockholm, in New York, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, because the best exchange points have everybody else. And if you can go with a single line and get 50, 60, 70 other networks, and off that gain megs or even gigs of peering traffic, you've just minimized your transit bill, it's probably worth the effort. So cost minimization is the other motivation. Curtis, uh, then I have time for one more question. And yeah, I just want to add one thing that Jeff said is that's very important is that we have gone from a model on the internet where 80% of all the traffic went to the US where all the content was to going to the fact that today 40 or 50% of the traffic goes to Google, goes to Akamai that does most of the web services you see and Limelight and so on, what's called CDNs or content delivery networks. These, pe these, customer, these uh, content owners will go and move this content out locally at this exchange point if you let them to and if you, ask, if you allow them to. I mean, there are countries who ban content from joining the exchange points, which is very weird. But if you can do that, if you can bring these content caches, as they're called, into uh, landlocked countries, into countries with relatively little bandwidth, and all the providers can access this, con this content uh, sh by a shared medium like the exchange point, you have saved an enormous amount of money off the transit cost that can be going into invest in the investments in infrastructure and service development instead. And this is another often overlooked fact of the exchange points. Thank you very much. We have time just for a quick, a quick question, and, and that's it. And we're going to Sorry. My name is Ahmed Badawi from Egypt. Uh, I want to ask about talking about uh, when you have a, lo a lot of uh, networks which are connected together, you have a lot of networks that are connected together, so that uh, if, if, if anybody tries to, to unconnect uh, anyone uh, of them, the server will go around the, uh, around the, the interconnection, or the problem is happen. Uh, in Egypt, that uh, during the revolution, we had like when they cut the all the internet uh, about all the country, uh, around all the country. I, I want to understand how this happened. And how can uh, yani how can it, how can we stop yani prevent this from happening in the future? Um, the 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 issue was about how can you stop, and I think it was single points of of vulnerability between a country's domestic infrastructure and the outside world, and the ability to exercise control over that single point. Is that sort of where I'm reading here? I'm not sure. I, I hear something called uh, the kill switch. The kill, kill switch. switch. Uh, but I don't know. Um, although you might have a diversity of network service providers, at a national level, at a strategic level, you might want to look at the diversity of connectivity. Which cables, whether they're under sea or on land, cables service your major population centres? How does that infrastructure wind its way around the country? Are there critical points or even single buildings that house all of the assets? In some countries, that's the case. In which case, be it a geological thing, uh, uh, any other kind of event, were that one building to be destroyed, there is nothing left. You've sort of broken all the connectivity. A country that looks hard at its infrastructure, typically looks hard at how to make things duplicated and robust. The beauty of the internet, as distinct from telephony, is that you can sit your routers inside a highly diverse environment, and then the routing system can take advantage of it. That if individual facilities are taken out, normally, as long as you've got enough diversity, you can keep things going. But that relies on that one critical sort of issue of how much diversity do I have uh, between my country and everywhere else? Where are the cable systems? How do they come in? Is there diversity going on? For some countries, there's been a conscious effort to do that. Other countries, it's been typically quite concentrated in one spot. And that one spot 
yes, as you put it, can become a kill switch. I think it, it could also be the case of um, many networks and the government ordering all the networks to stop traffic. So that, that could be also be the case. <laughs> yeah, uh, please cut this. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, I think that's an important point to keep in mind on this. And, and, and I mean, sadly and realistically is that if you have a country where you have a, a strong government or you have a government, the government can always do whatever they want, either legally or by using the, the, author the authority given the government. And that's nothing you can engineer around. That is a simple fact, the way government has <laughs> tend to work, right? And, and we can't build around that. We can't engineer that away. We can do, as Jeff said, to try to minimize the fact that this happens unintentionally and or, or to natural disasters, et cetera. That we can prevent against and we try to do. But we cannot prevent a government administratively shutting something down. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the panelists to uh, share everything with us and thank you for, uh, very much for the audience to, to be with us. Uh, we are going to be around just in case. Thank you. <laughs>